We call this session Responsible Science in a Perilous Time. And unfortunately, that phrase doesn't really need a lot of explanation. What kind of society are we aiming to build with our science and technology? What virtues and values should we preserve? What's going to most promote human flourishing? And what might risk it? We live in a very perilous time in this country. We've always been a country that argues pretty vociferously over politics, but until very recently, we at least mostly agreed on what the facts were. Um, and now we've reached a point where we have lost that core uh, a set of agreements, and that's making it very, very difficult to make progress on a lot of fronts. So one antidote uh, to this uh, factual polarization is meetings just like this where we all have an opportunity to talk about science and technology and inform each other and think about the ways in which that information can be used powerfully to make change. Like scientists are in fact using gene editing to try to make heritable changes to human embryos at the same time as we're having a conversation about whether or not that would be a good idea. Um, which isn't necessarily a problem, but you know, just to note the pace at which all of this is moving. This is all in the last five years. Um, uh, and of course the media is interested too in asking already these questions about whether it would be mandatory to actually do this kind of thing if you were a prospective parent and you knew that you carried in your family genes associated with a particular condition. This is, I think, a really interesting question because it's um, uh, taking us all the way back to, concern, to debates about to the eugenics, right, to the eugenics movement, to questions about reproductive choice and to questions about uh, disability rights and women's rights. So this idea that it might be mandatory or somehow obligatory to use these technologies to make these terrible changes is like already being discussed. Now, I think it's absolutely important to talk about the fact that while all of this interesting science is going on, women in the United States are losing access to very simple reproductive technologies in the form of contraception and access to safe and effective abortion. So at the same time as we're racing ahead and encountering all of these questions around eugenics and reproductive ethics, people are actually losing the ability to even prevent pregnancy from occurring. So how you put those two things together, I think is a really interesting question for us. We really need to bring emissions of fossil fuels to zero uh, in the next couple of decades. Huge challenge, a hugely essential challenge, but nonetheless a very big challenge. We may not get there, and in the context of recognizing that, a number of scientists are beginning to explore, mostly in the context of computer models to date, what the implications might be if we were to, for example, mimic volcanoes by, and this is kind of technically relatively simple, um, sending a fleet of uh, Gulfstream aircraft into the stratosphere to release sulfate aerosols or other reflecting aerosols um, uh, on, a, on a regular, somewhat continual basis. Um, as a complement, as a supplement to uh, aggressive reductions in heat-trapping gases. Imagine, for example, we got to a place where we saw that the Greenland or West Antarctic ice sheets were beginning to really destabilize, driving massive increases in sea level. And a nation, perhaps a rogue nation, perhaps the United States, I won't say that those are the same, um, uh, m might, um, might decide on their own in the absence of global governance initiatives that are really not yet all established to decide to take action to rapidly, relatively rapidly, in the order of weeks to months, uh, inject aerosols in the stratosphere to uh, cool the planet. I like to think of this as the worst possible way to address climate change that we need to take seriously. That today we don't have an effective defense, uh, and I don't believe we'll have an effective defense in the foreseeable future. The problem is that even building a bad missile defense, trying to put the technology out in the field, uh, can cause various types of problems. One of those is, uh, while it can't reliably protect the United States from a missile attack, uh, I think it did, as I said, uh, tend to keep people from taking the North Korean threat as seriously as they, as they should have. So I think it, I think it actually drained away uh, some of the urgency of, of uh, following uh, diplomatic efforts to, to deal with North Korea with the idea that we had this missile defense system and could, could deal with the problem if it, uh, if it arose. 
I also think it can be very dangerous to suggest to military and political leaders that they have uh, defense capabilities that they don't in fact have. And you'll see in our report that's, that's I think, an issue that has to be taken seriously. And finally, one of the things that uh, concerns me is that it has, uh, missile defense tends to undermine arms control. The reason that um, uh, international discussions about missile defense first started was that in the process of trying to reduce offensive weapons, it became clear that there was a link between offensive and defensive weapons, uh, and that, that link still holds. And so one of the things we're seeing today is that uh, Russia is refusing to talk about more arms control cuts. China is starting to slowly build up its arsenal. Uh, and people in those countries are telling us that those decisions are linked to the U.S. decision to put, push forward with missile defenses. If you take the uh, driver out of a cab service or an Uber service or a Lyft service, the price uh, per mile of that transportation goes dramatically down. And it goes down so much that for many, many people, it won't make sense to own a car, which is after all an asset that you buy that mostly sits uh, in a garage that you barely use. The economics will be much more favorable for not owning a car, but rather uh, calling these autonomous vehicles when you need them um, and, and then uh, not using them when you don't. Um, and that could happen very, very quickly. The case for electrifying these autonomous vehicles is very, very strong. And that's because while electric vehicles may cost more when you first buy them, they cost far less to operate. Electricity is much cheaper than gasoline per mile. These cars are incredibly simple uh, and have much lower maintenance costs and operation costs. So the more you drive, the more it makes sense for a car to be electric. Um, and so autonomous vehicles, which are intended to be driven a lot of the time, will have a natural incentive to be electric. So you can see that uh, this technology offers a way for us to move away from people owning their cars, which are mostly gas-fired, and to instead using, this, uh, using driverless vehicles as a service, which are mostly electric. And that could have significant advantages for getting the carbon emissions out of transportation. A gene drive is a, a process, not a thing, actually. It refers to the, uh, a process by which a genetic element, such as a gene, um, is passed from parent to progeny at a rate greater than would be predicted by traditional Mendelian genetics. So rather than 50% transmission, you might have 80, 90, maybe in the limit case, of, you know, approaching 100% transmission. And then in the progeny, it does the same thing. It carries along. So all, all of the genetically modified organisms' progeny will contain this new trait. And then all of their progeny can contain the new trait, assuming it's evolutionarily stable, and so on, until eventually this this trait can be driven through an entire population and potentially an entire species. The leading application uh, is driven by the Gates Foundation, and it's a proposal to reduce, suppress populations of the Anopheles complex of mosquitoes, which transmit uh, plasmodium, uh, which causes malaria. Uh, so they're, they are now working toward, slowly toward development of this drive and even beginning to prepare some uh, uh, release sites in uh, uh, Burkina Faso, Uganda, and Mali. One challenge is that there isn't one public. There are many publics. And we really don't know how to manage this variety of publics. Should it be the case that a vocal minority should stop something that many, many people and experts might think would be beneficial? And the reverse, should the majority always override a minority? And then who counts as a stakeholder? So in some policy areas, you have to have a direct impact on the person. The technology has to have a direct impact in order for you to count as having a voice that's got authority or, or a place. So we don't really know how to deal with the multiplicity of publics. And then another conceptual challenge is the tension between expertise itself and public views. 
So for example, even if we all agreed on something, even if there was a vast consensus among, in, in the public against, you fill in the blank, um, should we take that seriously? I mean, if we really mean that public engagement is central to democracy, then if you begin to ask the public and their views are different from what experts think they should have, what do you do with that tension? We don't like to acknowledge that. In fact, if you look really carefully at how public engagement is sometimes talked about in science and science policy, if you look really carefully, it really just means, oh, we need to do education that will pull the public along with us. That's not real democracy. If we're really serious about a democratic way of life in the most robust meaning of that phrase, then, uh, there's, then we have to have educated citizens who are willing and able to reason together on the basis of evidence and willing to deliberate about their value differences in the public square in some way, ideally at a community level where we can listen to each other with more respect than we see at the national level. <laughs>